My name is Jeff Davis, and uh, I am the uh, I don't know organizer for the Vancouver Informal Paranormal Pub. Uh, many of you, this is your first time here. Some of you kind of wandered in, and now you're trapped, and appreciate that. And uh, uh, we've been meeting here at the Under Bar in Vancouver for a couple of years. And so uh, I want to actually welcome our special, special guest, Clyde Lewis of Ground Zero Radio. And, and many, many other things. And, and uh, uh, I, I don't have to hand you the microphone because you can project. Among other things, Clyde has been the voice of God for various productions. Uh, he is he is one of the smartest people I know, and and he's a super nice guy. And so we're really privileged to have him. And uh, and he and I will be uh, actually I was, I was going to say he and I will be discussing various things, but I will actually be Clyde's foil because where Clyde Lewis sits is the head of the table. I'm so happy to have you here. And so uh, uh, you've already clapped for Clyde, but I'm going to ask you to, to clap again just for the topic, which is going to be Krampus Baby Christmas Myths. Um, somebody said, asked if the speaker's on. Can the rest of you hear me? A little bit. I guess I'll go adjust the little volume control. In the meantime, I'll entertain you by dancing. <laughs> How about this? There we go. Yeah. And there was much rejoicing. Yes. And soon we shall eat Sir Robin's vegetables. <laughs> exactly, there was much rejoicing. Yay. All right, so one of the things um, you and I were just sitting here chatting about was uh, you said that you had this one special Christmas story. What had happened is, uh, I used to be a writer and a producer for a radio show, I don't know if you remember, the Rick Emerson Show. Yeah, woo woo, Rick, Rick's a good guy. Um, I was uh, I worked with the Rick Emerson Show for a good long time, and I'd go to one of his gatherings, and it was me over at the bar just getting drunk. It was really, it was kind of, and I'm getting all blitzed, and Rick comes up to me and he says, well, one of our acts couldn't make it tonight, we need you to get up and tell a, a ghost story or a scary ghost story. It'll be all ground zero and be creepy, you say. And here I am, drunk, wondering, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. I, I, I'm just completely like, whatever. He says, no, tell a story. Just do what you do. You do it okay. Just fine. So I walked up, and everybody was like having a great time at this bar. The music was loud. Everything was crazy. I get up on stage, and I'm thinking, what am I going to tell these people? It's going to scare them. It's going to you know, drum up some Christmas cheer or whatever or whatever. So I said, back when I was a boy, my aunt, who used to live in Germany, would come to the United States and she'd sit us all down and tell us a story about the evil Santa. His name was Krampus. And um, I would tell stories about how Krampus would take the little children in his little basket and he would beat them and he would throw them in the river if they were bad boys and girls and all this. Just going off about it, you know, just constantly speaking about it. And by the end of the night, there was no sound in the bar whatsoever. Just, you could hear a pin drop. And I'm like wondering, what do I do now? I go, thank you. And I walked away. Nobody would clap. Nobody did anything. They just sat there going, wow, man, what a story. <laughs> and I think that was the first time, really. I mean, it was that long ago where nobody knew who Krampus was. Now everybody knows who he is, most people do. And those who don't, um, it's a very interesting story that Krampus was one of the characters, we used to say things like, you know, you know why unicorns don't exist is because he didn't come over on the ark. Well, Krampus is one of the characters that didn't come over from Europe in the United States until much later, uh, until somebody had seen on the internet the celebration of Krampuslauf, which happens uh, in the first two weeks or the first week of December. And uh, we have all these horned demon wood creatures that come out of nowhere, and they're in a parade, and they're ringing their bells, and they're beating children. And, and everybody's like, I think I want to try that. I think, you know, 
if anything coming over from Europe, I think that's cool. And so now uh, Krampus is a part of Christmas for a lot of people. Um, and it's because, and, and I've even noticed too, that I've always felt that Krampus is the revenge for Christmas music that's played too early. Because, you know, where I'm from, where I'm working, we have a religious station that's within all the studios. They started playing Christmas music on the 31st, October 31st, you know. Nosferatu wept. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, they played, they played Christmas music, and we were freaking out about it. But it just seems to me that uh, Krampus represented, I think it was easy for Krampus to come here because of that very reason, that people, you know, they hang on to Halloween in a lot of ways, but even in the original, uh, in the original ancient or older times, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas was all celebrated at the same time. It never was the idea that we'd separate them. It was always the Feast of Noel, or the Feast of the New Year, the Feast of the Yule, and then it was always, you hear that part in that song where it says, uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year, scary ghost stories and all the glories of Christmas is wrong. Why would they say scary ghost stories? Well, because of Krampus. Because of the scary creature that's out there that's waiting to come into your home and basically attack your family if they're not good. I mean, why? And it's because Santa wasn't enough. Santa didn't beat your kid if he didn't behave. Santa would bring a lump of coal, but you know it was Krampus that would always do the bad stuff. He was the bad cop, Santa was the good cop. And so that's, that's how we end up with these Christmas myths about, I mean, Santa is kind of the, the guy that, uh, Bell's Nickel was the original Santa, and he wasn't a nice guy either. He was just as bad as Krampus. And that's the thing is that you think about, a, 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 you think about a legend that's more than like 200, 300 years old, right? <coughs> And he goes from being a demon to being this good guy. And I hate to think what happens with Dracula, right? Dracula's about 500 years old. You know, we start having, you know, kids sitting on Dracula's lap and, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, you, you wonder how these notorious people wind up being so, so uh, good. But there's still that separation between the good and the evil. And Krampus is the representation of the darkness and the fighting and the turmoil that comes with Christmas. And we got to get that all out of our systems before, you know, we start going Christmas shopping and doing all the crazy stuff we do at this time of the year. And you, that was so insightful. I have nothing else to say. Uh, okay, Th those of you who know, yeah. Okay, pay your barb tab. No. No, um, uh, Clyde and I were chatting about this beforehand, and uh, my background is in archaeology and the ancient cultures, and, and I know Clyde is, is delving into that too, but he's, he's leaving me some room. You really think about uh, Halloween, saw one, or Samhain as some people pronounce it today, uh, part of the evolution that actually follows changes in technology and exploration is originally they used carved turnips as jack-o'-lanterns, and they didn't start using pumpkins until, guess what, they, somebody discovered North America, and we got those kind of pumpkins coming back. But looking backward in time, it's hard telling whether or not Krampus uh, had his origins in Scandinavian mythology or Celtic mythology, but I think it's a little of both, because you get Krampus stories coming from what we now know as the Netherlands and Frisia, uh, which is also uh, a Belgian area, and Denmark. And so, uh, Yes, the, you know, with the red suit, I've heard versions of permutations where his suit was not red, it was originally white, but from beating these children to death with those wicked wands, uh, that's how he got a red suit. It is not this red felt uh, of your traditional Santa Claus. But there, there were various times in prehistoric times where it was, it was all about human sacrifice to, to continue and reassure everybody that when winter ends and spring begins. Uh, for instance, anyone seen The Wicker Man, any of the versions? The Christopher Lee version, of course, being the best. Uh, think about this, the, the, with the, the, the little willow wands that they would use traditionally to beat the children and to make the, the baskets. 
uh, that's really kind of a spring thing. And so you harvest those and you split those, and it's later in the year that you actually use them to form wattle and dog. So this is like reassuring spring in the winter. And what's the best way to do that? Blood. And it's, it's so, you know, it's a good thing too if you have bad kids, you can eat, sacrifice somebody, not your best, but your problem children. And all of a sudden, silence. You're thinking about those relatives who should have gone first. Yeah. I just think it's interesting to know that whenever you said beat children, we have people laughing. <laughs> Millennials, can I say more? Just kidding. Uh, no, I. I, I always thought to myself that um, there was something missing. When, 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 my, when my aunt was telling me about Krampus, I always felt like there was something missing because I always thought to myself, how could Santa Claus be so merciful and so, um, you know, so kind? And there's so many bad kids in the world. There's got to be somebody out there that he can unleash on the, on the world to basically do that. And so, yeah, he has Krampus. Krampus is there to do that, to, to level out. But, you know, he, as he was talking about ancient uh, depictions, um, you can go all the way back to the um, Canaanite worship of uh, Moloch, which is this character that is a horned being that they used to sacrifice children to. And, and they did that because they were worried that the sun would return. It was called Sol Invictus. It was the idea that they made a deal with the devil, or they made a deal with this horned being, saying, if we give you the best of what we have, the best of our crops, the best of our children, the best of the best, would you please give us back the sunshine? Can you imagine, though, back in those days where it was so, so dark, and there was nothing to light your home, and that you'd have to open the doors and, and basically push out all the evil and light candles and everything, and then you're in your house, and you're hearing these animals or whatever they are howling in the forest, and you're thinking, something's out there that's going to harm my family. And, and, and the thing that's scary is that, yes, Krampus not only would attack farms, but he would attack animals too. He would take away animals, he would take away kids, he'd take away whatever, because he felt that he was entitled to that. Because he was there to enforce the good, and to force children to be good boys and good little girls. If not, they would face the wrath of Krampus. Not only that, but there are also stories of, this is really creepy, well maybe you guys should cover this, the seasoning of the kids. Right? The juniper berries yeah. and, and and some of these are evergreen plants, holly, and uh, uh, it's just again this gets back to these these plants that sh that should not be blossoming and fruiting in the fall and winter. You keep they keep on mistletoe. As a matter of fact, mistletoe is uh, throughout actually Scandinavian Northern Europe uh, has these mystical properties. Anyone who's looked at uh, uh, Scandinavian mythology, what's, what's the only thing that could kill the god Balder? It's mistletoe. And yet, we hang it, we hang it from the ceiling and kiss people with it to assure fertility. But in reality, mistletoe is a parasitic plant. You get, you get mistletoe within your trees, and after a while, it will actually strangle off and kill the trees. And so you have to appease the mistletoe, and it, it may well reward you with uh, with children or longer life. Here's another interesting thing about the paranormal and about uh, legends like Krampus. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that if you have a haunted house, okay, let's say you have a poltergeist in your home or you have something that's causing all that crazy, sometimes the way to ward off a poltergeist is to leave out cake or leave out cookies. I know this sounds weird, but it's true. If you leave out a cookie or a cake, sweets, uh, actually tame the poltergeist. So what's interesting is during the time of Molech and the children being sacrificed, the horned god or whatever, there was a time where they wanted to ward off the visit of, of uh, Krampus. And the way they did it was they figured they could fool Krampus into thinking that little boys and girls were being left. And what they did is they created something called the gingerbread man. And so the gingerbread man cookies were made to put them on a table so Krampus would eat the cookie instead of eat the child. 
So next time you're, you know, eating a gingerbread cookie, it's it's basically a representation of a child. Seriously, it's it's where you are you are basically it was the the the, the origin of it was to protect children to ward off evil spirits from eating them. So it was kind of like we were protecting children by eating the gingerbread. It was kind of bizarre in that way. But that's why we have the tradition of gingerbread men is because they were the representation of the children that you wanted to protect from Krampus. And, and uh, uh, thinking about this, this hoarded man uh, wearing either skins or, or a suit, there's some cave art that, uh, that's been seen in Europe that may date back 40,000 years. And there are various different interpretations of it, or you, know, you can Google it, and it's horned shaman or the, the horned dancer, where there's a depiction that very, very seldom in, in prehistoric cave art do they actually show a person. It's usually animals of some kind, horses, uh, actually mastodon, not mastodon, but horses, uh, woolly mammoths, all this kind of stuff is, is portrayed fairly accurately. Humans are oftentimes stick figures, which was what makes this particular graphic so interesting because it is recognizable as a, a human, more or less in profile, but he's bent over like an animal and he's wearing some kind of, he, he has, I can't say wearing, he has antlers on his head, but he's kind of turned facing the viewer as this piece of artwork. And so this is interpreted as a very, very powerful magic. Uh, when they were talking, archaeologists were interpreting the, the, the more realistic that they, that they drew these, these wild horses they were hunting, the more powerful their magic. And so they didn't want to magic people. So that's why they're stick figures. They're not really recognizable as an individual. And yet here we have this horned man-like figure dancing. Uh, who knows what for? How many people... Um are aware, well, first of all, how many people have seen the movie The Thirteenth Warrior? Anybody seen that movie? Anyone? The Thirteenth Warrior was a film, and I, I think it, it has a cult following, but it was about the idea that there were these Vikings, and they fought what are known as the Bear People. And the Bear People would come down the mountain with flames, it would make a flaming snake coming down the mountain, and, and they would, uh, it's a Michael Crichton story, I believe, but they would come down the mountain and they said there would be a big fiery snake that would come down. And then they would notice that the men that were on the horses looked like bears. And they ate, actually ate human flesh. They, they would attack and they would eat their enemies, right? And so they're saying, these, these men are bears, which literally become a werebear, like a werewolf. Okay? And, and so it was terrifying. But what eventually had evolved, okay, is something called the skinwalker. How many people are aware of skinwalkers? You ever heard of skinwalkers? Okay. Skinwalkers are basically a Navajo story. You don't bring it up a lot because it's a very terrifying story for them, but what it is is shaman and medicine men have been known to go into religious gatherings, put the skins of an animal on them, and become that animal. So you wear the skin of a wolf or wear the skin of a bear, and you can become that animal and you become ravenous just like that animal. Now here in the Pacific Northwest, we have the Bigfoot, or we have the, the story of Bigfoot. But we also have a story about the Wendigo, which the Wendigo is a lot like Krampus in a way, because what, what it is, it is a anthropomorphic being with large antlers or large horns that has been known to, its spirit has been known to attack campers. And the campers, there's been nothing left of them when they're attacked because they are ravenous creatures. Now, we don't know, um, in fact, I want, it's, it's another opportunity for you to do this because I love his story about the Alaskan, the Alaskan encampment that was attacked by a creature. What was the name of it? Do I didn't tell the story? It's really amazing. Okay, uh, Nantanak. I was uh, I I was one of the consultants for uh, the TV show Alaskan Killer Bigfoot, and uh, we're still hoping for season two. But uh, uh, they were they actually had so many weird things happen that uh, that they they couldn't even the editing couldn't even get that stuff in, and so. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, uh, among other things, what, what exactly Nantanak is, is they aren't sure because so many bizarre things have happened. Some people have talked about there was a, uh, there was a man who was going hunting and he was attacked by a, a tall, hairy creature, giant, that, uh, that almost killed him outright, but the guy's hunting dogs chased it away, so he told everybody what happened. And so uh, the, the, the town itself uh, is called Portlock in Alaska, and you can, you can Google Portlock. There's actually a pretty accurate Wikipedia page on Portlock. So fishing village turns into a cannery operation with its own mini fishing fleet, up to 100 seasonal workers there at the cannery operation. And uh, by 1949, they abandoned it virtually overnight. The only person left behind was the postmaster because he had to get permission to shut down the post office. But what had happened is, in a period of about 20 years, about two dozen, two dozen people, at first they would go up into the mountains to go hunting or prospecting, and they would disappear. And a handful of their bodies washed down the, the rains, brought them down into the lagoon, and they found them. Uh, they found what was left of them, dismembered and, 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 and killed by something that they knew was not a bear. They knew what a bear attack looked like. And so the, uh, the Nantanak got even more aggressive. And it was later in the year that, that the cannery workers were so afraid of these attacks because also they started hearing noises in the woods at the edge of the town site. They would hear and, and see things that they thought was an Antonac. They were so afraid that they hired armed guards to stand at the entrance and exit to the factory. And finally, one night, it got so bad that rocks and logs being rolled down the hills and crashing into the houses, everybody was in such a panic. It was in the middle of the night. They, they got their flashlights, they got torches or whatever they had, and they literally ran away with what they had and abandoned the town. Another maybe incarnation or another aspect of what may have been Nantanak is actually a woman that's been seen. And the native folk all throughout the Pacific Northwest talk about female ogres. These were giants. They were, they were not Bigfoot. They were not covered with hair. They were kind of human looking. But they used to wander the coast and they would carry, they would be 12 foot tall, they would carry clam baskets that were proportionate to being 12 foot tall something probably on the order of four or five feet long. And they would capture people and they would put them in these clam baskets and they would sling them over their shoulder and then they would take them to wherever their lair was and then they would oftentimes drown them and then roast them and then eat them. So we ourselves have these kind of things that have been going on in the Pacific Northwest since prehistoric times. It's funny you should bring up that there's a uh, female, because I'm, I was just picking up my phone here wanting to look this up, but I remember when I did a Krampus, I did a Krampus investigation, and there's actually, uh, I think her name's Freya. I don't know if, if that's her name. It's, it's basically the same as Friday, Freya, Friga, or Frega, or whatever. And I was looking to make sure I got the name right. I probably have it wrong. But apparently she, too, is a part of this Krampus story where she's a hag or a crone, and she also uh, has a, a switch that she carries with her, and that uh, she gives like cookies to the kids, and she's very nice to the kids, uh, unless she finds the bad ones, and then she shows up, and she uses the switch on the children as well. And so that's a variation on Krampus. So the idea that uh, Nantanek and this this ogre, this female ogre you're talking about, it, it just seems like it's the same story, and it's the same thing that people keep seeing, and that is an accom somebody accompanying uh, Krampus or accompanying the Wendigo or uh, accompanying Natanek, which uh, you know that's why I was so grateful that I was able to uh, remember the Natanek story that you shared with me regarding the, the I guess you could call the connections to Krampus and how it's based. I'm sure it's based on some wild animal or some um, animal that's not been located yet or some sort of a bear-wolf hybrid or something that could be there that would resemble that of a demon or 
uh, it would have a sheep shifting like appearance and no one really could tell what it is. Like you, you look at the, the stories of the skinwalkers. Skinwalkers are shapeshifters. They're shapeshifters and they, they can show up as different animals, they can show up as birds, they can show up, and, and you have, uh, gosh, there's other uh, legends, like for example, there's La Lechusa, which in the Latino world, La Lechusa is a winged creature that swoops down. Some say it looks like an owl, some say it looks like a, the angel of death, and it is an angel, or it's some sort of a um, uh, monster-looking creature with wings that comes down as well. So uh, even though Krampus, didn't have wings, as far as I know. He did, though, had ho uh, cloven hoof feet, he had horns, he had the, the face of a goat, and then he had the body of a human. And, and so that was how he was depicted. But I'm sure there are many ways you could see this creature, and you could say, it's a Bigfoot, it's a bear, it could be anything. But just the idea, like Nantanek, what he was talking about, the idea of an, an entire fishing town where people are murdered and they flee because they're so terrified of it. And then also seeing this ogre just reminded me again of the Krampus story where there is that, that old woman that follows him around as well. And speaking of old women, uh, anyone ever read some of the original translations of the Grimm's fairy tales, which are very grim indeed? Uh, -dum -dum. Yeah, it's so funny. Your tough crowd. Uh, there is a uh, Clyde. Have you ever heard of Mother Holda? So Mother Holda uh, uh, was was a goddess, and she was portrayed as a, as a as an old woman, not necessarily bent over and crone like, but she was old, and she would take in girls as as servants, and and that was actually a test. But to me, interestingly. She's portrayed as, as being old, and not attractive or unattractive, but with big teeth. Everybody who met Mother Holda talked about how big her teeth were. And consider this, um, medieval Europe, dental technology being non-existent. For anyone to have a lot of teeth in their old age, probably marked them as being something, a little bit of an oddity. But, um, uh, one of the things she would tell her, her female servants, I want you to shake the coverlet until all of the, all of the feathers kind of fly out. And when that happened, that meant, that meant Mother Holda was shaking out her, 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 her coverlet and it snowed. She was kind of a winter goddess. And if, if you didn't shake it out and the feathers didn't fly and there wasn't any snow, that actually, if you've been in any country where it's really, really cold, and there's no snow, you get, it's basically a winter famine, and it's not going to be good in spring. And so uh, one or two versions of some of these Mother Holda stories, uh, the ultimate, well, the, the bad thing is, it, well, if you were a good girl, you would go outside, and there would be, when she said, okay, your time with me is done, and there would be this rain of gold leaf that would stick <laughs> to the girls, and then they could go home, take off the gold leaf, and they'd have a dowry. If you were a bad girl, you get covered with pitch, and they have to pull your hair out in order to get the pitch off you. But the ultimate worst one is, did she use those big teeth for a reason? Because she would sometimes eat her apprentices who were bad girls. I found her. I just I wanted to make sure I was right with the name. Frau Perkta was her name. Uh, Frau Perkta would. Uh, a company, uh, Krampus, they call her the spinning room lady. She bears a resemblance to the Scandinavian goddess Frigga. All right, so it was Freya or Frigga. Frigga, of course, where we get Friday. Um, but she basically would go from door to door to find out if the women were spinning uh, the rugs and, and the blankets for the children. If they didn't, she'd set fire to their homes. So it, it, that's pretty scary stuff to keep people in line here. But yeah, Frau Perkta, uh, known as Krampus' assistant, uh, she would bring shame to families at Christmas time. She was known as a terrifying Christmas witch. So just the idea of an ogre woman and, you know, uh, what he was saying about what was in Alaska, it's the same story. So what is the story? Why is it that this is a, a why is it does this myth continue to flourish, especially in modern times?
I guess that's a counterpoint to, to today's world in America where if you're a bad child, your parents go to the Dollar Tree to get you your Christmas presents instead of... Or socks. Or socks. Uh, or some kind of a voucher for, uh, or a space heater or something instead of the lump of coal. So, uh, anyone have any questions or comments so far? Because, yeah. You know, the, I keep thinking about this when you talk about the creature with the horns. Do you recall the series of Hannibal? Uh, Hannibal, they, the serial killer Hannibal? Yes. I they, have, they always had a creature in there that had horns. And I wondered if that was kind of similar to what we were talking about. I turned this over to Clyde. I never saw the series. Uh, the symbolism of the horn creature, okay, that's been, that is an archetype that Carl Jung had talked about, that we have it in us, in our DNA, in our consciousness. Always the representation of a masculine, uh, taurine type of creature that demands a sacrifice, that brings judgment to everyone. So you can look at a serial killer as a, a, psycho, a psycho who passes judgment on people and kills them. This goes back anciently to the times of Saturn, where Saturn was like Kronos, and Kronos was the father that ate his children. Every year, the reason why we celebrate New Year's is not because it's a good excuse to get drunk, although, you know, that's fun. But I'm just saying, the reason why we do it is because we're celebrating the fact that Kronos, Father Kronos, Father Saturn, did not use his side to lop off your head. Because every year around that time, Kronos, or Saturn's side, goes across the planet and lops off people's heads or kills them. That's why there's something that astrologers call a Saturn return. That's why we celebrate Saturnalia. And, and Saturnalia is in the wintertime. And you've got Father Saturnalia that's a bearded guy. You ever notice that when you look at, back in the old days when they showed New Year's, they showed the old years of old man with a beard and the New Year's of baby? Well, that old man with a beard would carry a scythe. He was old man death. He was old man Kronos. Every year, old man Kronos decides to kill people, decides to eat his children, decides to beat and kill his children. You get the pattern here? Kronos, Krampus, it's the same pattern of people fear the new year. People worry during the winter festivals whether or not they're going to be around another year. And this is why we drink. We drink to the, to the idea that we have another year left. That's why we celebrate. Otherwise, Krampus, Kronos, whoever you call him, will make his rounds and that you will be in the ground. You'll be dead. That's why we, we should... I, I always tell people that you should look at Christmas and look at New Year's as a time where we have a little dignity, even though we don't. But and it's because of my grandmother, who was German as well, she used to tell me that one of the things they used to think about especially during the times of the Krampus tales, was how many Christmases you have before you die. And if you were to measure your life in Christmas times, then you would figure out or calculate just how many Christmases you have left. And that's why it should be a very special time of year. Because it, you've, you've made it another year, you're able to spend time with your family and friends, and you've got another year to try and go over again. So it's a bigger task each time you climb that mountain, and each time you have to meet the horned judge, the Saturn return, the Saturnalian god, the, the winter god who comes down and takes harvests. That's why they call it the time of harvest. Fall, you start to see the decay, you start to see the decline, you start to see the winter. It's all about the cycle of life. That is why Krampus wears red, because it, he also is the butcher. He's also the person who takes and takes and takes, and then the good ones are left behind and they receive the riches for their times. That's why every year is a new year, every year is a great year, because we look forward to a great year, and every time we pass that moment, we're lucky. We, we drink to it, we celebrate, and we have all these parties and festivals and lights and beauty, because it's all about light. You go from the darkness to the light. So we have to have a little darkness in our Christmas with Krampus in order to understand the light of Christ, the light of Santa, the light of all these characters that are there to remind us that the light is waiting for us. You know, he's absolutely right. I want to kind of work around to the fact that 
part of the reason you need sacrifices in spring. Um, consider this, is, is if you live a sedentary lifestyle, if you happen to be farmers or, or dairy herders or cattle people, uh, you're, you're actually eating pretty good summer to actually fall. You do the fall, the autumn harvest. And so, so you can actually have, kind of afford to feast in the, in the fall, and you can afford to sacrifice. The, 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 but if you didn't plan right, you didn't save enough, you didn't make enough, or your barn burns down, uh, just because it's spring and everything is growing doesn't mean everything is edible. There's this time period in spring for about a six week period when everything is, the shoots are coming up and the grass is growing a little bit, where you're, you're at the end of your, of your winter autumn harvest supplies. Yeah. Yeah, kibble. It's called kibble. Kibble, kibble. I'm sorry. I thought he was saying kibble. Was that okay? Yeah. Uh, just wanted to agree with the man. But, uh, and, and so that is actually the hardest part. More people in these traditional societies actually die March, April ish than they do over the winter time because your food's all gone and if things go wrong, uh, that's why you really need to actually look at sacrifice in spring as well. This is where we also get, again, uh, various bodies and things. Uh, anyone heard of bog bodies? Some of you have. And uh, mostly they're found in places like uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, uh, Denmark, and uh, in the Netherlands in, in peat bogs. I would hazard a guess to say this practice continued or was happening in the rest of Europe, but the sacrifices that they were making, uh, they didn't bury in the box, so we don't have the bodies. So we probably had this prehistoric fertility sacrifices going on all over Western Europe, but they've only found the bodies. And so uh, oftentimes they would find uh, what's left of a body or somebody who was buried in a bog, and they were killed in a, in the process of many different ways. The person would be uh, oftentimes be strangled, perhaps post-mortem, they're guessing, but some of these bones and bodies are well preserved enough that they can, they can hazard a guess of the order. Oftentimes the person may well have been brought to the, the bog, the place of sacrifice, maybe with a hood on, and then they're beaten severely with sticks or kicked, bones are broken. And then somebody gets a leather cord and they start strangling them until they're just short of asphyxiation and they're strung up or they're tied up and then they slit their throats and then they let the blood flow into the bog and, and bogs are not water and they're not land but they're both so symbolically they're this blood of sacrifice is 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 in the land and in the water and they've examined the stomach contents of some of these people and they've eaten some kind of a, a porridge of usually mix of different grains uh, wheat, rye, barley, if, if those people have been farming that way, but wild grains as well. Uh, in some cases, actually, deadly nightshade they found. But there's this whole mix of all of these plants these people used. And, and in some cases, they're figuring that some of these sacrifices were done in early spring with these spring plants. And then they were, uh, their bodies were, were dumped in the bog and nature covered them over and uh, the, it's an anaerobic environment, no microbes, and so more and more peat accumulates over these bodies for centuries. And what's odd and sad is, oftentimes there'll be people cutting peat. In some cases, with our huge uh, economic boom of, hey, I got a garden, let me get some peat moss. So they get these giant machines to harvest peat moss, and sometimes they will find only half the body because the machines actually cut the body in half. And so this kind of sacrifice, again, it's in a lot of cases it seems to have been springtime, is all part of this cycle uh, to preserve life. And so you pick somebody, you heard of scapegoat. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's odd that, uh, you know, there's also a, a time uh, in December called Children Mass, which is at times called the, the time for the children. And what it is is that we remember the children's sacrifices that have happened anciently. 
Not very many people celebrate it, but I think it happens around December the 15th. It's called Children's. You're supposed to have a meal in remembrance of the children. And what's odd is that in, in an odd way, when we're looking at Moloch, a god that you would sacrifice your children to, you're looking at Krampus where your children would be beaten or otherwise harmed in the winter, and you have Frau Perkta who harms children as well or harms women who don't, you know, put their houses in order. You look at all of that and you say to yourself, what is the purpose? And you realize that Christmas itself is about a meek child that was born who eventually was sacrificed. But he was sacrificed as a man and that he was supposed to be the sacrifice of all sacrifices. So no more of this needed to happen anymore. I don't want to get too religious on people, but all of this comes together in some sort of a major mythology that goes off into branch after branch after branch. We just choose a part of it that we say is fact, or we, we look at it, and we understand that there is a rich history in how the cycle goes. There's a rich history on how we look at life. There's a rich history in you know birth, death, rebirth. There's a symbol called the Ouroboros, which is a dragon that eats its tail. We just recently had a, uh, a uh, annular eclipse here in the Pacific Northwest. Many of us didn't see it because it was cloudy. But that symbolism actually is a symbol of the, the dragon eating its tail. It's the idea that life continues. Life always continues. There's always sacrifice, but there's always renewal. So whenever you feel like the world is going to hell, it has to go through that cycle and eventually we will find our way out. Everything's temporary. All the bad is temporary, all the good is temporary, we're always changing and we're always adapting. But now we're being told that we don't adapt, that we can't adapt. We can't adapt to climate, we can't adapt to new ways of thinking, we can't, but we can. Human life has for a long time. Human life has adapted to a lot of things from severe cold to severe heat, We've adapted to uh, rulers and, and uh, leaders that have put us through the ringer. We've gone through so many sacrifices and so many civilization drops and eliminations, but there's always somebody left behind to witness it. And the reason why I think that we fear the end of the world is because many of our ancestors have seen it happen over and over and over again. They witnessed something that appeared to be the end of the world to them. And that's why we have these creatures and these mythological beings like dragons and Krampus and all of these other creatures within our psyche. And they can manifest because we have the power to manifest them. It's the law of attraction. We bring these things to us because we worry about them, we think about them, and we're constantly being told to think and worry about them. But if we were to then back off and not think and worry about them, maybe things would go in a different direction. And that's the whole point of Christmas. Christmas is supposed to remind you that yes, there is darkness, but the light is always there. That's why we have Christmas lights, that's why we have Christmas trees, that's why we have Yule fires. It's because it reminds you of the light and warmth of all that is good. Sol Invictus, the sun will be victorious. The sun will return. Now do we get that metaphor? The sun will return. Interesting, isn't it? Play on words, right? Yeah, I could not ever follow that, <laughs> except with uh, anybody else have questions, comments. Anyone encountered Krampus somewhere? Come sit on my knee. <laughs> um, and I, I will try and follow this a little bit in, in that uh, since we have talked a little bit about Nantanak and, and Native American uh, beliefs and traditions here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, one of the things that uh, became very clear, there was a guy named George Gibbs, who was uh, uh, one of these, uh, he, he did go to college on the East Coast, this is in the 1840s and 50s and 60s, uh, this was before training of anthropologists, so he was uh, more of a natural scientist and an ethnographer. And so he talked to many Native Americans all the way up and down the interior of Washington, Oregon, up into, up into almost Alaska. And we, 
these are people with different language families and different traditions who who have been some of them their ancestors have been in the same place for thousands of years other people they were part of this movement uh, after after Columbus uh, population shifted a lot and yet he found some some similarities between some of these traditions uh, particularly here in the Northwest even among these people who who didn't have contact prior to say the 1800s yet they had similarities in that many of them believe that the earth uh, existed at one point and there were there were there were people there were animals there were gods and there, there were beings that were in between in that a crisis would happen and then the earth would change it would transform and then be reborn and some of these some people some beings who were gods before are now kind of they, their, their power is lowered and then they become uh, they become essentially still supernatural beings but they are not gods any longer. Some of them are not happy with it, but others are, and new gods rise up. And the, the Noah in the, the flood and the ark, a lot of parallels here in among the people. So there is renewal after destruction of the earth itself. Right. Don't don't make us end early. Yes. Tell me about whether or not you know the answer to the pyramid. The answer to the pyramids? The Egyptian pyramids. Well, you know, here's, here actually is what, it, what exactly is, is any specific question. Uh, how did they make them? Yeah. I've heard a lot of different theories. One of the most interesting ones is that uh, rather than rather than quarrying stones on the east side of the Nile and then floating them to the west and then dragging them, because the Egyptians didn't have wheels at that time. Uh, putting them on sleds and dragging them, or putting them on wooden logs as rollers. One interesting theory I had that I would like to see explored is whether or not they did, just didn't have uh, powder or, or chunks of limestone that they added chemicals to it, so those are actually made stones on site. They're like concrete, but it's all made out of a limestone formula. There, that has been suggested a couple times. I'm not sure if you heard about that one, Clyde. But I would actually like to have that tested. But what it means is you go up to the pyramid, and then you get a saw, and then you cut one of those limestone blocks in half. I don't know that the Egyptian government would let us do that. I heard that it was uh, extraterrestrial. Um, she said that she's heard it was extraterrestrials. I've heard that theory, too. Uh, one of the hard things that I, that I have is that some people have talked about how the three great pyramids are, are exactly parallel to Orion's belt, and that, and that that's a marker for the people who came from outer space to, to put the pyramids up. Here's a, here's a funny thing to think about, it is astronomy and the physics of the Earth itself. When they made those pyramids about 5,000 years ago, See, the Earth isn't just spinning around. And the Earth isn't just spinning around on an axis. The Earth is spinning around on an axis, but it's also wobbling. Have you ever had an old-fashioned top where the top is spinning around and then is just about ready to fall over and it starts wobbling? The Earth is doing that at the same time. That's called precession. And so that because of precession, the, the actual constellations change over about a 12,000 year period. So about 5,000 years ago, Orion's belt didn't look like it does now. So even if you try figuring out the proportions of how far apart the pyramids are versus how far apart the stars of Orion's belt, um, it wouldn't work 5,000 years ago. The other thing that's interesting about uh, the pyramids is, are you familiar at all with the Sidonian region of Mars? The Sidonian region of Mars, a lot of people uh, who poo it, but I still believe in it well, and I've talked with Richard Hoagland, who came up with the theory, and then Face on Mars, and Jack Kirby, if you remember him, the writer of many comic books, also talked about the Face on Mars. But the thing that's interesting about the Face on Mars is that when you see it, it's just another version of the Sphinx, and then there are like three other pyramids in that area. For those of you that don't know, Sidonia actually is Egyptian for city on Mars. Oh, no, wait, Cairo. Cairo, the word Cairo means city on Mars. So I find that interesting, that Cairo, Egypt, city on Mars, and then there may be a duplicate city on Mars that looks like where the pyramids are. Isn't uh, there supposed to be life on Mars right now? 
Well, depends on who you talk to. Um, Gilbert Levin believed there was life on Mars back in 19, 1996. Elon Musk. Elon Musk, I'm sure. Speaking of Elon Musk, um, here's another thing if you want to, another weird thing. Um, the, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, von Braun, Werner von Braun. You know who Werner von Braun is, right? Werner von, Ra Werner von Braun, who was a scientist at NASA back in the 1950s, wrote a book called Mission to Mars. And it was his theory on how, on what would happen if we went to Mars. And so when we arrive on Mars, according to his book that was written in 1958, the astronauts who landed on Mars met a group of people there, and they had a group of elders that led them. Do you know what the name of the elders were? The elders of Elon. Which is crazy. Which, yeah, 1958, elders of Elon. Now we have Elon Musk wanting to go to Mars. Kind of bizarre, right? And somewhere in that whole mix, Gary Sinise is walking around. I think so. Just uh, either inside or outside the pyramid. No, I, uh, even though, as a counterpoint to Clyde, I seem very skeptical about everything, you know, these things have to be discussed. You can't stomp on, on all the stuff Clyde has talked about and just dismiss it as being, having no, you know, not mattering, so we're not going to talk about it. it. It should be explored, just like I was talking about precession. I would, I would like to go to a planetarium and have them actually, some planetarians, uh, when they set them up, they didn't understand how precession works. And so if you've ever, if you've been to a planetarium and you've seen them, particularly their Christmas special where they, they rotate the sky back for you, like here's what the sky looked like when Jesus was born, they don't, t some of them don't take that into account. I would love to actually do one of these uh, world events uh, in past, and, and look at the constellations to see exactly what what the sky looked like. Then you might well find some of these alignments in some of these very ancient monuments. Um, interesting thing about Stonehenge, to the best of our knowledge, Stonehenge is the only one of these Neolithic monuments that didn't just have uprights, but had lintels, had these top posts. The, the, as far as I know, that's the only stone one that ever had that from the very beginning. So that's also something to think about. 1953, a scientist said the title of the leader of the Martian government would be Elon. That's the headline. I bet was the year I was born. So that's uh, Von Braun. Word of Von Braun, book Project Mars, a technical tale, said that the Martian government would be headed by a group called the Elon, and now Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. So that's pretty much bizarre, I think, that that happened. History repeating itself. Well, I hope he doesn't sue me. He does have kind of a very wooden expression. So maybe that's actually, we're not seeing his true face. And anyone ever seen The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie? It's kind of a cult classic. And, uh, and he was a Martian who comes to Earth for various purposes. And at one point, they actually unmask the Martian underneath. Questions? More questions? Any questions? This is your only chance to have Clyde Lewis live answer your questions. Oh, no. Yeah, we got something. Oh, sure. Go ahead. No, it's you, not me. Go ahead. So, uh, you talk about Krampus, and, uh, and there's a lot of kind of demonic picturations of goats, uh, or goat like features. Is there anything that, besides the creepy horns and creepy eyes, that, uh, that has to do with goats? Do you mean goats or ghosts? Goats. Goats? Yeah. Goats. Uh, there's Pan. There's the green man. Um, I think that when you look at goats and when you look at bulls, I think that they are representations of fertility. There's even depictions, and see, we're, we're all adults, right? So there are even depictions of Krampus with a very large penis. So uh, the phallus is also something that goes along with the goat and with the with the bull, which basically uh, gives us the idea that these are creatures of promiscuity, creatures of fertility, creatures that uh, prey on people and attack them sexually as well. So, I mean, if you look deep enough, the goat is a representation of, uh, of virile 
fertility. I think the Spanish word is cabron, which means goat. Uh, that's another uh, word that, you know, when, you, when you're looking at the goat or the bull, it always represents testosterone-filled taurin, uh, you know, creature or character. The minotaur, that creature as well. Um, okay, uh, and, and this reminded me, not necessarily of the goat, but of the bull itself. Uh, even older than uh, the Minotaur in ancient Greece, which is another one of these, we have to make sacrifices to the Minotaur, uh, is a place called Chateau Hayuk. Uh, and, and, and forgive me, people of Turkey, for my bad pronunciation, but um, that is has a place in the arm wrestling match for the world's oldest city. Uh, maybe as long ago as uh, 5,600 years ago, uh, people have built up a, a city, a cooperative living space of adobe houses where there was no street entrance to all the buildings. They were, had these adobe walls and you would climb on a ladder to get to the roofs. And so uh, living space was on the, well, social space was on the roof. Uh, they had these empty spaces, these atriums in between where it seemed like the people dropped all their garbage but they, they tended to live on the outside, but they had living quarters and granaries inside, and they had uh, a lot of what it interpreted as household uh, shrines inside. And one of the major features that they found were actually were uh, depicted were bulls, were, were cows, uh, and sometimes they would have the actual horns of a bull, and I think in one or two cases the skull, that they would coat with clay, and they, they would work that into this household shrine. And again, it, uh, this interpretation of, uh, of fertility, and uh, they would throw, they had grain, they, they didn't seem to farm, but they harvested wild grains, and so they had these granaries inside their houses, and they would throw fetishes, these, uh, these objects, these dolls, these clay figurines, hopefully to also preserve what they have. And some of them were uh, females, some of them were male, you could tell by the penises. Uh, the females you could tell by the enlarged genitalia as well. And so very close to the earth. But it was because even if, you're, even if you have a good harvest, uh, hunter-gatherer people, if things go wrong and there's a famine, they can walk somewhere else. If you happen to be tied to the land as farmers or animal herders, you've got nowhere to go. And so you have to apply to the gods and make sacrifice to them. And it reminds me of the King Kill stories where if uh, a king is over a kingdom and the harvest is bad, they kill the king. Yeah. That was an old uh, thing, the, the, the representation, again, of Saturn. The king, the rings, you know, when you hear the Lord of the rings, you hear, the rings are Saturn. Everything, robes are Saturn. It's all, you know, Saturn. Uh, and of course, Satan, Saturn, the judge. Uh, the robes of the judge are from Saturn. The robes of Darth Vader, the Dark Father. Dark Father is Saturn. Kronos, the Dark Father, Dark Vader, Dark Vader, Darth Vader. It's all part of our archetype inside of us. We know. That's why we respond to things like Star Wars. Because, you know, Darth Vader is the Dark Father. He's based on the Saturnalian icon. The dark masked figure that is your father. Kronos was father Kronos. Saturn, the rings, all of that. It all is part of the Saturnalian Saturnalian celebrations we do at Christmas time. We don't celebrate Saturnalia, but it's all part of the Saturnalian norm. Which reminds me, uh, I lived in England for a year when I went to college. And uh, after World War II, well, during World War II and leading up to it, it was expected you'd be going to church every Sunday. And especially, again, the, the holidays of Easter and Christmas. And following World War II, when the central government didn't really have as much need of the church because they became a socialist country, uh, they went to kind of a, like a very subtle campaign of kind of undermining people's need support of the, of the Christian church in England. Uh, even though churches still exist uh, and they're supported more as, as landmarks, one of the things I found really interesting was uh, my first Christmas in England, all of my, all my college chums were saying, oh, we got to go home so we can watch Star Wars. 
on Christmas Day, they ran the Star Wars trilogy 4, 5, and 6 as a replacement for going to church for services. Darth Vader. It all comes together. Um, one of the things about Santa is that he looks like, they call him Father Christmas. Again, with reference to Father Kronos. Kronos means time, Father Time. It all comes together. See, this is why we have our mythologies, because they all come together in some way, and we celebrate them in many different ways, but they all have these base ideas. And another thing, and they don't want to step too far out of bounds here, but there is also the idea that the whole Krampus Santa Claus story is nothing more than a child's tale of the second coming of Jesus. That first the devil shows up, the devil shows up and tempts everybody, and then coming from the sky is a bearded man wearing red. Because it says in the apocalypse that Jesus will not return wearing white, he'll be wearing red. So you have a white bearded figure coming down with red clothing, representing the blood of those who have died. It's the same thing, it's just a different myth. The same stories that we were raised as we were children, it's all a part of the process. But if we learn more about some of the ancientness, we find ourselves understanding why we believe what we believe today. So, you can say there's no Santa, you can say there's no Krampus, but why then is it in our consciousness? Why then has it manifested itself in front of us? Because it came from within us. Everything that we do comes from within us. And this is why our mythologies stick. This is why we find ourselves drawn to certain mythologies like Mouths to a Flame. This is why we are the way we are. And it's a beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing to think that we've had all of these legends and mythologies that make up who we are. Joseph Campbell's book, The Power of Myth, I recommend all of you read it. Because once you read it, you realize that we are walking, talking mythology receptors. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because it's what makes us who we are and makes life very interesting. I, I find myself flabbergasted at the thought that Christianity borrows from other religions. Yeah, they do. I uh, bet that, that really brought down the house at my Masonic Lodge meeting, but I guess not here. <laughs> uh, uh, one last question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Christmas is not about the birth of Christ? Well, it is. It is. Yes. But it, to some people, it can be about other things, too. They embrace the paganism. Clarifying that. Okay. Jesus was born. Jesus wasn't born in December. Okay. December 25th was on his birthday. He was born in, uh, they, they, they would say that he was born in the fall, September, maybe even the spring. Okay. So we celebrate his death in the spring. For some reason, we celebrate his birth in the wintertime. But the truth is, is that the reason why Christmas is in December was because they had to embrace the celebrations of Saturnalia. And so the church declared that since we're celebrating anyway, we're celebrating the son of the father, the father and his sons, the father not killing us all, let's make it December. So that's why, yes, Jesus' Jesus's birth, yeah, happened, but not in December. December 25th, Christmas, is the, the time we celebrate it, but we celebrate it because, but what we did, what was interesting, is we took Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, and New Year's, and we separated them for each holiday. Thanksgiving is the Feast of Saturnalia, okay? Christmas is Saturnalia, the, the, the celebration of, of Saturn not killing you into the New Year, okay? So that's why, I mean, Halloween is the scary part first. And then what do we celebrate after that? Dia de los Muertos, or the Day of the Dead? It's because the veil is thin at Halloween where the evil spirits all come down first, like Krampus. And then we have this renewal where we give our feast and thanksgiving to Saturn, that he didn't kill us. We celebrate Saturnalia in the celebration. We bring the light back, Sol Invictus, and bam, we talk about the new year and toast ourselves because we made it another year. That's why we did it. And we think of Jesus, the son or the child that was sacrificed so all will live. Isn't that bizarre? 
um, one of the things is, all jokes aside, some people take this as, a, as an anti-vindication that uh, Christians aren't celebrating Jesus' birth on the right day. Uh, a lot of these people, I find it interesting, they don't mind celebrating uh, Veterans Day with a federal holiday when it's not on, so. on the 11th of November, which is Veterans Day in reality, or these very much public holidays that are all now on Mondays, a whole bunch of school kids are kind of being raised to think that every U.S. president was born on a Monday, Martin Luther King was born on a Monday, and so on. Thanksgiving used to be two days, but for Democrats and Republicans. Seriously, at one time. Yeah, Thanksgiving used to actually, yeah, two different dates. So uh, that does not make Christmas less Christian. It just, what it does is it just it makes it part of a, a longer tradition that I, I actually like quite. I find this kind of comforting that we as a species of people are so much in touch with our roots, even if we don't know it. Uh, we're part of this long tradition that goes back 10, 12,000 years. Maybe. And Even the Jews light the lamps in December. What does that tell you about light? It's all about bringing the light back to the darkness. It's all what we celebrate. All right. Uh, if nobody else has any questions, I will actually ask why did he has final words. Just the final words is, like he said, um, I find it very fascinating that deep within all of us, we have archetypes that we know about, that we respond to. Whether it be a princess or a prince, a dragon, or something else. The magic of Christmas is with all the characters that play a part in keeping it magical, whether it be the demonic or the, the, the terrible idea of Krampus coming and terrorizing you, to Santa Claus bringing cheer to the children, or even Jesus being born in a lowly stable, and the idea of that sacrifice that we then carry into the spring. But all of these ideas are carried on because we have some sort of base mythology that we all subscribe to. And every single one of them, I think, has worth. Every single one of them is why we all have the holidays. So don't be offended if someone says happy holidays because the whole thing encompasses every part of the season. And since we're almost at Christmas, I feel guilty, but I'll say Merry Christmas because I won't see you guys, or happy holidays, I won't see you guys until then. So, you know, while the Christmas music is playing, we might as well tis the season. Have a drink. Give thanks the Kronos hasn't lopped off your head and have a merry holiday. Cheers. And, uh, thank you. Uh, and, and kind of administratively, thanks to the underbar, and there are things they're going to be open and there are things going on after this. If you are interested in the paranormal Vancouver informal paranormal pub, uh, second Sunday of each month, People start showing up at three, talk presentation at four. Uh, Rocky Smith, who's my co-host, and I, if I can get it, will be reading a, a vastly different version of A Christmas Carol next month. So I hope to see all of you back if you're interested. Other than that, thank you all. Eat, drink, and be merry, because we see Kronos is waiting at the top of the stairs. All right, thank you all. Thanks.